it's my honor really to get to speak with you today as people who love the prairie and who are working hard to maintain a lot of this land in Texas in a prairie state. And I wanna talk specifically today about cattle and how we might be able to use cattle as a biological control measure to help us maintain our prairies uh, in a more healthy way. So the plan for today is to talk about a basic introduction to biological management with cattle. And then we're gonna go through the plant's response to grazing. So what actually is happening to that plant? And knowing that information, how can we apply that to responsibly grazing or knowing when we should add cattle into the mix for our management? Then we're gonna talk specifically about cattle management with some wildlife species of interest. That way we can look in a little bit more depth on what they might require and how cows may help with that or what things you should look for to be careful that you don't overlap too much in diets. And then finally, monitoring for success. So I think it's very important that we follow up with what are some simple ways that if you did introduce a few cows onto your place, that you could monitor your land to make sure that it's maintained in that state that you like according to whatever your goals are. So I kind of want to start there. I always start with goals. Uh, goals are a little bit huggy feely. Um, I think that sometimes that's a hard thing to think about because it's a little more abstract. I think going out and doing things is a little bit more exciting. But if we don't have written goals, I feel like those are dreams in our head. And when you finally write them down, that becomes a plan. And when you start to mix different uh, livestock and wildlife management on a piece of property, it's incredibly important that you have solid goals written down so that you know if you're making a management decision that's gonna take you in the direction for your land that you want. And that sounds very simple because you might know why you have property or what you like to see the property look like, but a lot of times we don't think about what steps we would take to get us moving in that direction. So I feel like your goal should be very specific. And by that, I mean not, um, I'd like to make a profit or cover my taxes, or um, I'd like to restore it back to its natural condition. Those are all great um, things to have as goals, but I think we need to be very specific about, is that on the whole property? Are there some pastures that you would manage differently than others? Are there specific plants that you're wanting to see there? Are you trying to restore the big four tall grasses of the prairie? What are your specific goals and what animals, if any, are you managing for? Consider them adaptable. I think the scary thing about writing down written goals, no matter if you have an acre or 5,000 acres, is that it's hard to think of them as adaptable once they're written down. It seems like it's set in stone but you should be revisiting these goals every season or every year and seeing if you're moving in the right direction and how you might wanna tweak them according to uh, maybe the weather conditions or different uh, path you wanna take or something new you've learned about that you wanna try. And then the objectives should follow every goal. So by that, I mean, um, you might say, I want to maintain the deer sex ratio according to what Texas Parks and Wildlife tells me would be healthiest for my property. Well, you need to make objectives of how you're going to uh, get to that goal that year. Is it that you're gonna host some family hunts? Are you going to allow youth hunt? Are you going to make sure that so many deer are taken that year? Or are you good and you just need to make sure you do another census? All of those are your objectives. And then at the end of the year, you can go back and say, did I or did I not meet my objective that is leading me closer to my goal? And I think it's just more fun to work with a property when you have these itemized goals written down. And it's also a lot easier for anyone who's trying to help you or provide support to you to fully understand how you want things to look. That way they can give you the best advice possible. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is introduction to biological management with cattle. And I like to talk about biological uh, management because I think that's exactly what cows are. Now, there are some diehard uh, cattle operators whose goal is to maximize cattle production for a profit on their place. That's their main goal for their property. But they would, they would manage their place very differently than somebody who's wanting to use cattle to manage their native property 
in a state, you know, to kind of restore it back to a native state. So in that sense, you're just bringing cattle in as needed to help maintain the land. So it's very cool that we can look at management practices that we have in our toolbox for rangeland management. And that's how you would manipulate the plants on your landscape and decide which are best for our situation. Now, when we get used to a certain type of management, um, it, we tend to go that way more often. And remember that when you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail and that's not necessarily the case. I think it's important for us to open our mind and think very creatively, even if we've never considered adding cattle onto a property before. So I like to picture in my head, I have this like little red uh, cute toolbox and inside that toolbox for rangeland management are these main four goals. So you could also add native seeding. That's kind of a, a way you can manage the vegetation on your place. But when we're manipulating what's already there, we have four main choices. That's fire, prescribed fire, chemical management, mechanical management, and biological control. And biological control could mean insects that are de developed to attack certain invasive plant species, could mean goats, but today we're focusing on cattle and the use of cattle because as Gary pointed out in the introduction, cattle are sort of mimicking what we used to use bison for or what the land I should say used to use bison for. And so it's kind of interesting that now we still have those tools. It's just a little bit more difficult to know how to apply them because bison sort of moved themselves. They knew how to move across the landscape to maximize the, the grazing efficiency that they, they took part in. So is vegetation management always worth it? Do you need to do something? Um, I'm a range specialist, so I get asked a lot, if range land is just supposed to be native land, why are you managing it? And the answer is simple, that the principles of range management are to better the soils and the vegetation and to maintain useful outputs for that land. And I'm very proud to work in range management because we have the soil health, we have the vegetative health, we have all of these components in mind to where you're looking at things very holistically and you make management decisions based on holistic views of the place instead of based on one component of the place which may or may not be affecting other components, kind of a domino effect. So is management always worth it? Well, that's why you need your written goals. You would consult your goals and make sure any management practice that you have is gonna benefit your goals for the place and not harm other goals you might have for the property. Plan for follow-up next year. Usually management is not a one and done thing. It's something that needs to be continuously applied in the right and correct way. And I like to say on a conservative scale to make sure that you're not tipping the balance in a different direction than you intended it to do. Consider the effectiveness if you're trying to control vegetation or if you're simply trying to suppress it. So an example might be if you're trying to control King Ranch bluestem versus just suppress some really thick um, switchgrass that you have. Very different ways that you would go about doing that. And we have the tools in that toolbox to do either one. And then try on a smaller scale. I'll always like to encourage people to think small. Um, I know that the, the actual saying is think big, but I want you to think creatively, but, but put things out in a small way so that you can see how your land in its particular state is going to respond to make sure that that's what you want the rest of your place to look like. Um, so is it what you hope for? Um, weather patterns are unpredictable. So what might, uh, you know, like this year, we all look like genius range managers because we've received a lot of rainfall and we have a lot of grass, a lot of green plants, but in other years, it's a struggle. And so weather can really play into whether or not things went the way you were hoping they would. So when you do practices on a smaller scale and you think smaller, but more creatively, that's when I think you see the bigger returns for your investments. And do you really need a hammer? Uh, just because you uh, bought that really nice shredder, do you really need to run it? Um, if you're very talented and you're in a group that does prescribe fire, is it appropriate to apply this year? Or uh, do you have invasive grasses in the field that might spread as a result of the prescribed fire? Um, we just need to think creatively and really focus on what management tools are going to best move us towards our goal. So we know that the livestock diet is varied depending on what species we're talking about. And today I said we're going to focus on cattle, which have 
a diet very similar to the bison that used to run this area. So cattle eat approximately 81% grass. So a, a good majority of their diet is grass. If you think about a cow mouth or a bison's mouth, they're very wide. So when they eat, they stick their tongue out and they actually rip the grass uh, from the ground. And so whatever is in that, that tongue grab is what they're eating. So obviously they'll still eat a little bit of forbs. They do eat brows. I've seen them eating directly off of a mesquite tree. Um, they, they diversify, but the majority of what they eat is going to be grass because that's what they're built for. They have very large bodies. They take in a lot of this roughage, which, you know, we could not survive on straight grass. Thank goodness, because I like things that are a little bit more tasty than that. But this grass, they can take in in large amounts. They ruminate, right? They're ruminants. So they actually eat. They go and lay down in the shade. They bring that food back up. They chew that cud and they redigest it. And so they are able to extract enough nutrients from that fairly poor quality food in order to survive because they've got that huge gut that can take in that amount of food. Now, when we think about a sheep, they're much smaller. So they still eat quite a bit of grass, but they diversify and eat a lot of brush brush or brows and forbs. And that's why um, they're looking with those smaller mouths for more nutritious bites because they wouldn't be able to take in as much roughage in a day as a cow would because they have much bigger body. And then goats down here, uh, my dad always said that goats would eat the tin off your barn. Um, that's not true. We have a couple of bottle babies now, but um, they eat a, a good amount of grass and brush or browse off of trees, and they still eat a little bit of forbs. So they have a very diverse diet, and you can tell by their mouths that they're able to be very selective in what they take in because, again, their bodies are not large enough to take in strictly grass like a, a cow or bison would. So let's talk very briefly. I know you've heard people talk about stocking rates of livestock, which are key understanding your stocking rate and what you want to do is very important, but that's simply the number of animals that are on a given amount of land. So that I call it the coffee shop talk. Um, if you're in a coffee shop and somebody says, oh, I run one to 10, well, they run one animal to every 10 acres, or I run, run one to 20. That's one animal unit for every 10 acres. And the, te the technical term for an animal unit is one cow with a calf in third trimester. So uh, about a thousand pound cow is what we're talking about for an animal unit. Now, carrying capacity is what I prefer to talk about. Carrying capacity, which you've probably heard in the wildlife world as well, is sustainable stocking rate. So that's taking into consideration um, brush encroachment. Um, if you built a, a house and you have a yard around that, what amount of your place is actually grazable? What could a cow take advantage of? You also take into consideration that we have larger cows now. We have higher temperatures, more evaporation. All of these considered means that you might be running a more conservative stocking rate than the people who previously owned your place. And these are not bad things. These are just things that we have to understand because carrying capacity is the ability to run that stocking rate long term. So it's not a snapshot in time. It's how can we best care for the land in the long term. So the old saying on taking forage for livestock or how to figure out how much forage could go for livestock was take half, leave half. That has adapted a little bit. So we still agree, research has shown, you must leave at least half of that plant standing. Now you might say that's very confusing because the leaves are at the bottom and then there's the stem with the seed head at the top. Well, you don't really count the stemmy part. We're talking about the leafy material on that plant, taking it down to about half of what it was. That's where you would wanna stop. You would wanna move your livestock off of that land because we know that the other half is livestock. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. You wanna leave half. So you wanna take 25% of that for your livestock and through time, we've learned that 25% of that is going towards trampling from animals and insect damage. We've all seen how insects can suddenly come in um, and really take over a place and eat quite a bit of forage on our place. So they can do a lot of detriment to our vegetation as well. So those are something that you always want to consider when you're thinking, how much forage do I actually have for livestock? It's probably whatever you could do to leave 50% of that still standing. Now you might be thinking, what's that 50% for? Well, 
believe it or not, study after study after study has brought up really good reasons to leave that 50% stubble. So the first thing is to maintain healthy roots. So we're gonna talk about how plants respond, but let's think through this. There's plants on your property that are at varying levels of interest to these cows. Cows have these ice cream plants that are higher in nutrition. They're more digestible. Those are the ones they're gonna graze first. So what we know is cows will go out to the pasture, graze that grass. Then once that grass is like, okay, no problem, I'll start to regrow. They're gonna go back and graze that same grass again because they like it. And then they're like, okay, I'm gonna regrow. Cow comes back, grazes it again. Here. Over time, where are cows not putting their effort? Or where is the plant Here. not putting its effort? Let me see if I can. Oh, I cannot. I'm disappointed, I'm disappointed too. No. Um, okay, so they're grazing this grass, and that grass is not putting its effort into growing its roots. So over time, those grasses that are grazed very hard, which again are your better grazing grasses have shallower root systems. And so when we go dry, those are the first ones to go because they can't reach that subsoil moisture. So overgrazing land is not profitable for the long term because you are going to kill off all of your better grazing grasses. So when we monitor, and we'll talk about that at the end of this presentation, when we monitor, we're going to look for our better grazing grasses and watch what they're doing to make sure that they're not overused. And we'll get our cows out of there before they use more than 50% of that grass or that leaf coverage. So leaving that 50% stubble not only helps maintain healthy roots, but it is great for wildlife cover. It prevents soil erosion because it's holding that soil steady. Um, it reduces evaporation because those that leftover leaf is shading the, the soil surface. It improves rain infiltration because those roots are breaking up that soil and allowing that water to drop down into that subsoil area. It reduces the invasion of less desirable plant species. We know for something to germinate, it has to have sunlight. So if you've got a good coverage of desirable plants on your place that you've grazed properly, then that stubble will help shade out the ground so that those seeds, those weed seeds you may not want there, have less of a chance of germinating. Um, when that plant goes dormant, that 50% stubble goes as organic matter or litter on the ground and is incorporated into the soil as organic matter. And the fact that you have to remove your livestock from that area so that those plants can only be grazed to 50%, it reduces soil compaction because if you leave cattle on an area for a short time, their hooves can actually do some good for the soil but you leave them there for a long time and they can start to compact the soil. So it's hard for rain to infiltrate. That soil will start to erode off. A lot of negative things when you get soil compaction. So here's a little graph that's pretty cool. This is based on some data in South Texas where they looked at leaving different levels of forage standing. So in January, they had a hundred pounds per acre standing 500 pounds per acre and 1500 pounds per acre. When the 100 pounds per acre received almost 17 inches of rainfall, it was able to produce back up to 2000 pounds per acre. Not bad, right? It uh, went all the way from 100 up to 2000. But check this out, the 500 pounds per acre that was left with about the same amount of rainfall was able to double that amount that was grown. And the 1,500 pounds of forage on that, uh, left on that acre in January was able to grow about the same 4,000 pounds per acre, but only on almost 10 inches of rainfall. So it's interesting because you can see right off that leaving stubble is not only going to be beneficial for all of the things that it's gonna be used for right there, but it's gonna maintain those healthy roots and that plant's gonna come back like gangbusters for you the next year. So it's really a beneficial cycle to be grazing at a, a moderate level. Now here's a look at leaf removal and root growth. So this over here is your reduced root growth or how much root growth is stunted. And down here is the amount of leaf that is removed from cows grazing. 
So we know that when you remove 60%, just over our 50% recommendation, when you reduce it by 60%, then you have about 50% reduced root growth. 50%, that's incredible. If you think about switchgrass, it's really tall and it has roots about that deep in the ground. If you take it down instead of 50%, you go a little bit more to 60%, they found that those roots will actually come up about half of what they would have been. Um, very important to pay attention to. And here's another example. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. 80% um, reduction in plant growth, or sorry, leaf removal is a hundred percent stunting for 18 days of that root growth. So the roots will not grow at all for 18 days, which is very detrimental to that plant, that uh, the root system is supposed to absorb all that nutrients and water from, from the soil. It can't do that any longer. And so depending on what happens within that 18 days, if it's able to carry itself over or not, is very touchy. So taking too much leaf is very tough on that individual plant. So let's look at these plants and their response to grazing. So there's something called the grazing optimization hypothesis, which really started back in the late 70s, early 80s, but it's still really referred to today. What happens is um, this zero is neutral. Plants aren't growing, they're not decreasing, they're just sitting there. Above this line, the plants are growing or increasing. Below this line, they're decreasing or starting to die off. So as cows start to eat and you add more and more cows, which is depicted by my bigger cows that I put at the bottom of this chart, as your grazing intensity increases, at first, plants often increase because a lot of our plants, remember, they developed with bison grazing on them. They can handle some pressure of grazing. So at first, they're going to increase, and then they're going to hit a point to where they start to decrease again. So the first question, oh, and sorry, at the top here is what we call the optimum grazing intensity. And that's what you would be looking for is how can I take off as much of that grass as possible without harming that grass, basically. Well, the question here is why? Why when you start to eat down a grass plant, would it continue to grow? What functions allow it to do that? Well, there's two different theories to this. One is sunlight penetration. That's simply where the photosynthetic capacity of those leaves, where they're, the sunlight's hitting the leaf, it's making sugars or carbohydrates that are feeding that plant. The capacity of the individual leaves um, increases because sunlight is able to better get down to the bottom leaves. And the compensatory photosynthesis theory is to uh, that photosynthesis on the clipped leaves is going to end up being higher than it was before when it had more leaves. So basically compensatory, it does the same amount of photosynthesis no matter how much leaf material you take off to a point. So two very similar theories, just different ways to look at it. So that's why we're increasing. Now, why do you get to a point and all of a sudden that grass says, hey, 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 I'm out. I can't keep growing. This is too much grazing intensity or grazing pressure on me. Why does that happen? Well, um, it happens because like we looked at in that picture, your roots start to be affected. And so you don't have as much leaf to feed that plant. The roots are shrinking up, so it doesn't have as much ability to feed the plant from the root side, and so that plant eventually will die off. So we are trying to aim for this optimum grazing intensity or even a little bit more conservative than that. Now, there's actually three ways that you could look at this, and this came about from um, several different researchers who have proposed different views, but there are some plants that kind of follow what we just talked about they can take a good amount of grazing pressure up to a point. There's other plants that do not take grazing pressure very well, probably because their growing point is high enough when it's uh, eaten by livestock that it kind of shuts down that plant right away. And so it might look more like this line to where any grazing pressure starts to crash that plant down to death. This option is another way that some plants might respond to this grazing optimization hypothesis. And that's that you can graze them like crazy 
And then once you hit that maximum uh, carrying capacity for them, they automatically go off. And so it's very important to understand that we probably have a combination of these plants on our landscape. And that's why when you're monitoring, it's very important that you're checking out all of your important grasses and making sure that they're all responding well to the grazing pressure that you're putting on them. Because of course, you're gonna to wanna to start out with a fairly low to moderate grazing intensity and then add to it as needed. So research has shown that the positive effects of controlled grazing, which we don't really call it that anymore, but of basically grazing with a purpose compared to no grazing at all, are most likely in areas receiving over 400 millimeters of average annual precipitation, which is about 16 inches. So this is based on uh, the range management and principles book, which is kind of like the, the holy grail for range management. And so that's sort of where they found their cutoff. And if we look at Texas, that pretty much, you know, I've heard anywhere from 16 to 20 inches of rainfall. So we're talking about a split somewhere around this erky yellow color. That's where we might have to be a little bit more careful about grazing pressure and making sure that we're running low stocking rates so we don't overuse those resources. But anything on this side of the state it seems to be prime for adding livestock in as a way to utilize forage that would actually make the land better than if it had no grazing at all. So then you might ask if we have all these principles and we have all this knowledge, why do people overgraze? Um, I know I ask myself that question all the time. And I think when people overgraze, it kind of gives a bad rap for having livestock on land because it's easy to think that that's just what livestock do. That's not what livestock do, that's what livestock managers do when they're not properly managing the livestock. So we know that heavy grazing does a number of bad things, including decreasing photosynthesis. It doesn't, the plant simply doesn't have the ability to carry on photosynthesis reducing carbohydrate storage. Um, that's the ability of that plant to produce those carbohydrates or sugars and store them in the root. Reduced root growth. So we looked at that, how it shrinks up the roots. Reduced seed production, because if it's eaten off, it'll never even go into that reproductive state where it shoots that stem up with the, the seed head on the top. Reduced ability to, to compete with ungrazed plants. That's a big one. Remember I said the first ones to die off are your good grazing grasses because those are the ones that have been grazed. Um, so over time, you would actually see a plant community shift. Reduced mulch accumulation, and this decreases soil water infiltration and retention. But when you look at the flip side, light to moderate grazing, so we're not encouraging no grazing, but at least a little grazing, actually tends to increase photosynthesis with most plants on the rangeland. It increases tillering where they're coming back from the buds of that grass, which is beneficial because those bunch grasses can add on a lot of new tillers and create a bigger bunch grass that's beneficial for a lot of our wildlife species, like ones that utilize bunch grasses for nesting, reduced shading. Um, so when you eat some of that grass off, it does allow sunlight to penetrate. And some of those good forbs, for example, to be, have a chance to even germinate and grow. Um, reduce transpiration losses because there's not as much leaf there that has the ability to lose some water for the plant. Um, there are some theories where there's inoculation of plant parts with growth promoting substances they think could come from the saliva of livestock and the reduction of excessive mulch. So we do want some mulch, but excessive mulch may, that may be physically and chemically inhibiting that vegetative growth. So there are a lot of pros and cons to grazing and much of it depends on the level of grazing or the intensity of grazing that's introduced to that place. So here are some potential reasons for overgrazing, why people might overgraze. One, I just have to say it, ignorance. They're not aware of what they're doing to the long-term health of their soils and the vegetation on their place poor monitoring skills. And that's why I really wanted to include at the end of this presentation, some very simple monitoring techniques that you can employ to make sure that you're grazing uh, healthfully. 
the consequence of drought and investment. So once we hit a very dry period, there's not any forage for livestock. People try to feed their way out, which is not profitable at all by providing hay. But you know, we think of it as just cows, like get rid of your cows. But a lot of times people have selected certain breeding in their cows and they've built their genetics in their herd over time. And so they have a certain level of investment in these cows that they're gonna automatically lose. And so they try to hedge their bets on whether or not they should feed it out for just a little while. I can tell you from some scenarios that we've run through modeling that trying to feed it out will not work. It's best to even get rid of everything and start all the way over, or maybe start over with a more conservative stocking rate that won't be as high of a risk. Um, so there are some consequences of drought and the fact that they have invested in this herd. Short-term thinking versus long-term thinking. And that's really thinking about our stocking rate or what forage we could utilize now. You know, if y'all went out right now and all did clippings, you clipped an area, we extrapolated that out, and I told you, wow, you've got 7,000 pounds of forage per acre this year. Well, we wouldn't want to stock based on a year of abnormally high rainfall. We would be looking at something that's more of a long-term planning or how you would be beneficial with adding in livestock as a management tool for your prairie that's more conservative because we wanna base that on our averages and even go a little bit lower than that to lower your risk for years where we don't get much rainfall. There are quite a few absentee landowners now and I see two things from that. One, they might try to keep up their own herd but it's very difficult when you're having to drive back and forth to the place to keep an eye on it. And two, leasing out to people who are untrustworthy and are not caring for the place as if it's their own. And perhaps one of the reasons might be that land is just a poor match for the operation. So around the area that you all live, um, you have fantastic grazing land, but there are areas of our state that are not very suitable for cattle ranching, or they might be suitable for very, very low numbers of cattle ranching. For example, my mom owns 100 acres of deep sandy country. It is a beautiful piece of property, but when you think about the amount of livestock you can run on there, she was thinking about getting cattle. And I said, I bet you could get two cows. And she was like, two cows, get real. It's like, that's all your land can support. So if you want to feed them with hay, you could run more. But to be a responsible grazer, you would have two cows. Um, so it's just the reality of what land can support. And sometimes that doesn't match with our goals. All right, so there are so many pros to grazing plants on a prairie that I got a little bit overwhelmed even trying to figure out how to pare down what grazing could do that's so beneficial uh, that I wanted to pass on to you today. And so a lot of these, except for the last few I'm gonna give you on the next slide, came from a paper where Holacek, who is from New Mexico State, a really renowned range specialist, he was trying to show that livestock grazing on public lands was doing a service because you can imagine out west where they have to manage these public lands and they don't even get as much rainfall as we do. They are um, dealing with a public who has an opinion about what they're doing on that land and they don't understand that the grazing livestock are not simply there as money makers for the BLM or whoever's running that land they're actually there serving a purpose um, as an ecological, uh, having an e ecological role in the management of that place. So one thing that happens is grazing loosens the soil surface during drying periods. That hoof action can be really great. It also um, can help to push seed to where you get good seed to soil contact. So in a way they can even help plant plants. They kind of get the soil ready for them and then they plant seeds. Um, the removal of excess vegetation that might negatively affect the carbohydrate fixation and the increased water transpiration losses. So basically taking off some of that excessive vegetation has a lot of benefits um, to the, the plant's ability to thrive. Incorporating mulch into the soil profile, which speeds development of humus. So that organic matter that 
is a small component of our soils, but incredibly important for long lasting effects of keeping these vegetative um, plants that we have out on our landscape productive, recycling nutrients in the ecosystem and making some nutrients more available than they would have been if they had not been grazed and then gone through the process of having urine and feces reapplied to the property. Maintaining optimal leaf area index, that's just keeping the right amount of leaf there to where photosynthesis can take place, but other plants can thrive around it. Trampling seed into the ground, reducing ex excess accumulations that may chemically and physically inhibit growth. This, this next one I haven't seen a lot of theory on, but this is interesting that it could inoculate plant parts with saliva which may stimulate plant regrowth. So it's like a, a trigger, which if you think about the role that bison previously played, that may in fact be true for, for your area as well. It can reduce fire, insect, and rodent problems resulting from vegetative accumulation. Um, light to moderately grazed plants are more productive than those that are ungrazed. Um, kind of gives them that boost of ability to be able to, to grow back up. Uh, managed grazing may increase water quality, improve watershed mulch and vegetative cover. And they found that on some studies, there's no difference in surface erosion or water quality. So I know we've heard very different things from some studies in Texas, but if you have good vegetative cover on the land, there would be no reason that cattle would be adding to coliform numbers into waterways on your place. It's when we don't have that good coverage to where we're having soil erosion that you might be able to find some of them in there. Earlier soil warming in the spring could actually create a, a boost for that spring green up. Um, that actually comes from the extension regenerative grazing series of publications that are out. Decrease moisture loss from transpiration and initiate growth from dormant axillary buds at the base. So when you remove that vegetative cover, there are some buds down there at the base that the new tillers will grow from if stimulated. So if you remove that apical dominance, it's called on the top. And so you're creating a base that has a lot more stems and you'll get a bigger, broader plant. So those are just some of the reasons that grazing is beneficial directly for plants on our landscape. So we know that if you're going to add livestock into the mix to actually have them out there mimicking maybe what bison used to provide to our, our prairies, then you have to have a lot of other things in the consideration at the same time, which I realize can be a little bit daunting. So I wanted to just kind of work through some of the things that you might have to think about. One is fencing. So you would either need permanent fencing like a barbed wire fence or electric fencing. So electric has become a little bit popular because uh, number one, it's cheaper and two, it's very flexible. So if you're trying to use livestock in kind of a targeted grazing way and you want them to really concentrate on certain areas that may need grazing, then you could use this electric fencing quite easily with a, a little solar panel that can run it and be able to fence off essentially anything you want. Um, so that's kind of the new deal, especially for people who move their livestock very often and are trying to utilize their land in more of a regenerative manner. Water. Water is a very important component that is something that 99% of people, if they're gonna add livestock to their place, will need to think through because you'll need to figure out how to get different watering sources across your land. And of course, when you move to a new paddock or you set up a new paddock with that electric fencing, you're gonna need to have water provided there and enough to supply all of the cows or the number of cows that you're planning to have in that pasture <clears throat> or paddock. You'll need some sort of working pens or mobile corrals something you can uh, click together very quickly if you need to move those cows to another property or um, another area or take them um, somewhere else or even just work them uh, providing vaccinations or deworming. Um, you'll need shade so obviously cows like to go and relax underneath shaded areas so you'll need some decent trees that um, you wouldn't mind livestock hanging out under. Um, sometimes people like to consider predator control or prevention it may not even be a problem in your area, but um, it's something to consider because at times you may not realize you have a problem until it is a problem. 
Um, so that's something that you some you need to keep an eye on at least, especially during calving season. And some ways around this is to bring livestock maybe closer to your house or to a, a safer area, more open area when you're ready to calve. Um, seasonal considerations. So there are times of the year that are rough and they might need some supplementation put out um, during drought. You might have to feed them hay or get them off of that place before they overuse your resources. And then of course you'll need a trailer or some way to transport them or at least a trailer that you can borrow when it's time. You know, there are a lot of things that if you worked with a group or with a co-op who are utilizing livestock as a biological um, management method, there are ways that you could share a lot of these resources to be where it wouldn't really be that much of a financial investment. And you could kind of decide where they would go at what time. And uh, you could actually time it so that people who are getting more rainfall, those have the livestock first and move them along. But we'll look a little bit more at the, the seasonality or when you want to hit, hit these plants for grazing in just a second. So when we talk about grazing, there's a, we, we said you need fencing, but there's a few ways to look at this. One is continuous grazing. And I can tell you that I'm not a big fan of continuous grazing. It's just hard to be a good range manager if you do continuous grazing because these livestock have full reign of your entire property at all times. So you might have fences up, but they're open. So those cows can essentially go wherever they want. With continuous grazing, they're going to utilize your better grazing grasses first and not really do much for the less preferred plants. And so if you're trying to knock back some of these grasses by using grazing, it would make sense that they need to be in a little bit smaller of an area so they can really uh, utilize those plants before you move them on to another place. Deferred rotation is a much better way to go. That's where you're grazing maybe even more than half of your pastures at one time, but you're allowing some to be deferred or to rest. And that's when those plants are able to regrow their roots, they're able to regrow their leaves, they're in a good healthy condition before those cows ever cycle back into that area again. So one thing I like about deferred rotation is that you could actually have a very small herd that you permanently keep. And I call those your mama cows. So your, your mama cows that are gonna have calves might be very conservative but on years like this year, when we have tons of rainfall and lots of vegetation to use, you might consider bringing in stalker steers to where they could take some of that forage off for you. Another thing is if you don't really want to have mama cows there all year long, you could simply buy stalker steers as needed. So they usually feed those out for three or four months and then they go to sale. So you don't really have to worry about um, keeping something there year long. Another thing that's getting more and more common is short duration grazing. So that's when you would keep them in a smaller area and you would move them more frequently, but these areas are able to rest. These pastures are able to rest for a longer period of time. So by the time you come back to them, those plants have more than recovered um, to their pre-grazed condition again. Sometimes people even put them in smaller paddocks and that's when we're really talking about using electric fencing, getting them to, to almost um, evenly utilize the plants in that paddock and then moving them to another. I know people who even move every day and they just have the system down with the, the lines for their water to where they can do this quite quickly. Innovative grazing can also be done even if you don't have fences um, with water. So cattle will naturally congregate around your water area. So you also have to kind of watch they don't overuse in that space. But you could simply turn on or turn off all but one water and the cows are naturally gonna kind of congregate over near that water. So that's the part of the ranch that would get grazed. And then you could turn on another water and move them towards another part of the ranch. Um, this is commonly done out in West Texas where it's either difficult to build a fence or um, it's too expensive to build a fence for the large acreages that they have. Um, and I always worry, you know, like how would cattle find water? But I assure you, I would die out there and the cows would know exactly where to go. Um, so this, this is one way that you could move them even without investing in fencing. Another is with fire. So if you could consistently patch burn 
cows will naturally follow that burn when that new green growth comes up because we all know that is the most nutritious plant out on the landscape at that time. And so everything tends to congregate in that area. So if you could burn a small patch, your cows would naturally flock to that area. You would get at least a few months of um, heavy use off of that land, and then you could potentially move that patch burn to another spot. All right, so we have uh, quality versus quantity. So up here we have quality of uh, a dinner, right? This is very actually similar to what I had tonight. So when we have a very balanced meal on our plate, that's of a high quality and it might be a, a moderate quantity, but nonetheless, that's kind of what we're shooting for on the landscape. We're providing a lot of different plants across there. They're able to pick and choose what, what they can utilize for their nutritional needs. Now, if I gave a kid a stack of donuts and said, hey, tell your parents I already fed you. That would be a little bit concerning because that's not a good um, nutritional plane, is it? It's the same as when I've gone out to a place and somebody said, why are my cows doing so poorly? I have grass everywhere. Like, well, you got a lot of three on, you know? It's a grass that's not desired by livestock. And so obviously they're not gonna be able to thrive on grass like that. So we know that the quality of forages vary seasonally and grasses are the highest quality when they're young and green. And then they're the least quality when they're more mature because they're more stimmy. That stimmy or that lignin is very, that cell wall is hard to digest. And so the greener, leafier material is gonna be preferred over anything that's older. All right, so this is a little bit confusing. So bear with me here, but this dot right here is forage digestibility. That is the ability for that animal to take in and utilize the nutrients that are in that um, food. And then here's the forage yield, just strictly if we went out and measured how much grass you have on your place. So over here, when that plant is young, kind of in the infant stage, it's just growing. And so it's not very tall, so there's not gonna be a whole lot. The forage yield would be pretty low, but the quality of that forage would be very high. But we really try very carefully not to graze a lot in this state because that growing point could easily be taken off at that point and then that grass would cease growing. So over here on the other end, we have maturity when they go into reproductive stage. So they shoot that stem up, they've got the, the reproductive head or the seed head coming on. This is not very desirable either. In fact, livestock will avoid plants at this point because it's too hard to digest and they can't take much of it in. So the optimum area to be grazing is in this second realm where the plant is leafy and still growing to a point at least, um, and its digestibility is still pretty decent. So what we try to do as uh, grazers or when grazing is keep cows on plants so that they can kind of maintain a good nutritional plane in this middle of the road growth phase on that grass. Hope that makes sense. So not when it's small and first coming out, not when it's older and it's got the stem elongated already, but somewhere here in the middle. So when we have competition on, on our land, it's the demand of two or more organisms for the limited environmental resource. Typically competition between say wildlife and livestock is gonna happen when we one, have less plant diversity, which we don't want on our prairie anyway, we're managing for diversity of plants or we have too many animals, quite simply. So these are things that we could manage for, right? These are things that could be within our goals for the place and utilize livestock to help us meet our goals. So you might ask why have both livestock grazing and wildlife management besides all the tons of reasons I already gave you that vegetation or your grasses will really benefit from that grazing. It'll actually keep them healthier. There are some pros and cons when you think about it from a wildlife standpoint. So when you look at the literature or the research, the views are all over the board. Yeah, grazing is great. Mm, grazing is fairly neutral or grazing is really bad. You're going to mess up your place if you put a cow on it. And it got me wondering, why is this? What's happening? 
One is people are looking at different things in their goals for their paper. So when they write their methods out, they're either looking at stocking rate, which is just the number of animals on the unit. They're not thinking about long-term carrying capacity. Or, you know, some people are looking more at intensity or how much of that grass has been grazed. And that's what we really want to look towards. So if they have just a static set number of animals on the place, that's almost dooming it for failure. See what I mean? There's no art to that. There's no measuring what the resource or that grass is doing and then getting them the heck off of there. That's just setting a number and saying, this is what we're going to do from this date to this date. So there's the difference between stocking rate and grazing intensity. There's also something in the literature where you see where there's different goals for the grazing management. Um, a lot of the people that I talk to who are livestock producers, that's their number one priority, even though a lot of them also manage for wildlife, they might say that they're going for profitability with their livestock. Whereas if you're trying to maintain a, a native prairie and manage for wildlife, you're gonna be using livestock as a tool for your management, not necessarily maximizing the number of head you can run on the place. Two very different goals. And depending on how you set up your study, you're gonna get very different answers on how livestock do with wildlife. The design of the experiment, again, that art, I've read some papers where they say, we're gonna put them in this pasture for this many months, we're gonna put them in this pasture for this many months and this pasture for many months. Well, what about when it doesn't rain or what about um, when there's no good plants in that third pasture. There's a lot of things that have to be considered before we design the experiment. And there is an art, as you know, to land management that is hard to account for in scientific pro uh, products. And that's why we often see varying viewpoints on whether or not wildlife and livestock can coexist uh, well. There's also a variation in the response from wildlife species. So it might depend on what wildlife species you're looking at as to whether you're happy about it, neutral, or kind of sad about the way it turned out. Such as this study where they reduced plant height to 30.5 centimeters just by grazing. And then they looked at the effect on different bird species. Well, they had uh, 52 species that it had a positive effect on about 171 species, it was a neutral effect, didn't hurt them, didn't, didn't do any great good for them. And then a negative effect for 29 species. So you can see, depending on what species you're really interested in there, you may or may not have differing views on how that went. So how do you know if grazing is good for a wildlife species of interest? Well, Technically, you'd be looking at animal productivity, including the population size, reproduction, survival, and animal size. And a lot of times our studies are designed for a master's student, which is typically two years. So we don't get a lot of this long-term data from some of the practices that are implemented in our studies. We also have to take into consideration that when we're incorporating livestock and wildlife, we still have to take into needs of the wildlife to figure out if we're utilizing those livestock well. Um, what food do the wildlife species we're managing for need? How will that compete with our livestock? Um, remember that they need cover. They need escape cover, nesting cover, which is grasses. They need brooding areas that have actually been grazed a little bit so it's opened up and they can move around in that bare ground. They need fawning cover, roosting sites, um, and then between the different changes, they even need different levels of diet or nutritional quality. Um, we also need water for our wildlife, um, so we can't completely shut off maybe all waters that we were uh, utilizing for livestock and only turn on one. We might need to provide a supplemental water in some pastures. Um, we need to think about the ease of hunting, how we might want to graze to, to lower the stature of the plants in some areas. Um, think about the home range and how the grazing is affecting those animals on a larger scale. And then, of course, spatial, spatial location or how all of these different components that are needed by the wildlife we're managing for fit together and how our livestock might be able to improve them. So keep in, in mind specific needs of those wildlife species, of course, the habitat structure and the season, as we just talked about. I wanted to point out that there are some papers on Atwater Prairie Chickens in Texas where they concentrated on grazed pastures and they were avoiding ungrazed pastures. 
Um, and then later, or not later, earlier, Lehman and Grange had reported um, that they were avoiding thick, matted, and ungrazed cover. So it's very interesting that something that's sort of gotten a bad rap is actually something that could maintain lands in much better states for many of these uh, ground nesting birds. So let's look at some cattle and some specific wildlife species very quickly because I see we're coming down on time here. Um, we know that the wildlife species need different things. Deer eat a lot of browse, a lot of forbs, and a little bit of grass, probably the more nutritional regrowth of grass. Quail and turkey, which turkeys are kind of like big quail, they need a very diverse diet, a lot of seeds. They eat a little bit of insects, especially their, their young chicks or poults. Um, so they need a very diverse diet, a very diverse landscape to be um, successful on. So grazing cattle and deer. One thing that we can see is that cows could open up areas where really thick grass has been and allow sunlight to penetrate to grow more forbs. And man, deer would really appreciate some more diverse forbs in there. But what I want to remind you of is that cows can compete too. So we wouldn't want to put a huge number of cattle on the landscape thinking they're going to eat all our grass all as well. Because cows still eat a percent forbs. In fact, this study that was done on Wilder Wildlife Refuge down in Sinton, Texas, um, found that about 39% of their diet was actually forbs, whereas the deer at that time, the particular time of the study, it was about 72%. But if you look at that on a weight basis, uh, an 1150 pound cow, which would be a, a fairly decent sized cow for today's standards, would take in about 11.7 pounds of forbs in a day. Whereas a deer, even though they eat 72% forbs in their diet, are only taking in two and a half pounds of forbs a day. So be sure to think about the overlap that could also occur. So in most cases, you're going to want to kind of graze, flash graze with your livestock and then get them out of there. And so they don't overuse the resource um, when you're, you're trying to actually use them to create the resource. They did other um, comparisons in the same study on welder and they found that they had the lowest forb overlap in their diets uh, during the fall and summer. And that's probably just because there's a lot of grass that's available, maybe less forbs available even. And the greatest overlap was during short duration grazing where they're grazing smaller paddocks, but at a very heavy level. So that makes sense if you take down um, all of the forbs and the grasses in an area to give it kind of a, a level playing field before you move them to a new place. You're not gonna come back to that place for a long time, but in the meantime, there's not a lot of forbs and a high level of competition, not much diversity, too many animals. So the cattle and deer study conclusions are that grazing increased diversity until we had a drought. And then you started to see some overlap. Deer were more sensitive to the grazing treatments um, so you had to be very careful that you did not remove too many by doing a very heavy um, or a high stocking rate. Cattle and deer diets are very distinct, but there are times of the year that they do overlap, especially during drought and when the stocking rate is too high. So um, they preferred, they found from their study that you should use moderate stocking rates, which for your purposes in um, using them as a biological tool would be probably low to moderate stocking rates and using rotational or less intensive grazing for your efforts. So let's look at cattle grazing and quail. Quail were used to manage rain, or sorry, cattle have been used to manage range condition for a long time that benefits quail. Light grazing with less than 15% brush has found to be um, optimal. Light grazing with less than 20 to 30 inches of rainfall is also optimal. Moderate grazing is best if you have more than 30 inches of rainfall because you're going to have more uh, forage resource that you need to take out to benefit quail. And then it's interesting that when the range condition class is excellent, so that means you have a lot of grass, then the nesting cover is excellent for quail, but the food value is very poor right? Because you don't have a lot of those forbs in there to provide seeds, hard to get in there and find insects. And on the flip side, when you have a poor class condition or not much grass for livestock, um, or maybe you've already grazed most of the grass with your livestock, you have poor nesting availability in those bunch grasses, but you have excellent food value. 
So it's interesting that quail need a whole range of range conditions. And so you can utilize those livestock to create this um, structure on your landscape by grazing at different intervals. And then grazing cattle uh, with turkey, with turkey management, some grazing they found is better than none for turkeys. Consider exclosure, so areas that you would only graze every two to five years and allow them to maintain some height in plants because obviously turkey is a little bit bigger than a quail. And it's great to graze in July and August, kind of at the tail end of their nesting season. You want to leave vegetation 18 to 24 inches tall with inner spaces. So obviously turkeys need cover. They also nest in bunch grasses on the ground, um, but they need the, that area for their poults to maneuver to find seeds and insects once they're born. You wanna monitor your rates, your grazing rates closely. So you always wanna make sure that you have a more conservative stocking level than you think you need to make sure that you're only utilizing the amount of the forage resource that would be beneficial to whatever you're managing on your place. Um, so we have a number of publications that can walk you through how to figure stocking rate and then figure out what would be a conservative number for that. So remember, there's a few management advantages for grazing with wildlife that we covered. One is utilization, utilization of that grass that a lot of our wildlife don't straight up eat. Um, and that allows more inner spaces of bare ground areas for them to get seed and insects and to reduce the stature of the plants that are on the landscape. Remember, it can create forb production. When you open up that bare ground, you increase the diversity of plants within that thick grass. Um, and usually removing uh, less than or equal to 25% of the annual forage on that place is not detrimental to wildlife. So there is quite a bit of grazing that can naturally take place on your land that will not impact your wildlife species at all. And finally, structure. We know that the structure that you can create with different management practices like burning in this picture can also be done with cattle by grazing at different intensities or in different patchworks across your land. So let's end this all with monitoring for success. I wanna go through a few things that you might be able to look for to make sure that you have good vegetative coverage on your place. One is soil capping. If you see soil capping, it's a sign that you don't have enough plant coverage because the rainfall is able to hit directly on that soil and it's actually hitting so hard that it, it makes a cap. So I was probably a weird child, but I used to pop up a piece of soil and play with it. That's actually not a good sign. It's a sign that you need more plants, as is a erosion shelf or real erosion. That's pretty obvious that there's not enough plants there, but when you start to see these different reels across your place, you know that water is sheeting on your land. And so there's not enough plants there that are rooted to stop that water or slow it down and to keep your soil from eroding off of that plot. And of course, litter dams. We've all seen litter dams, especially right now. We've been getting tons of rainfall, but litter dams is where that water has sheeted across the land and pushed that litter into a row looks like a little snake. And that's because there weren't enough plants there to slow it down. Another sign that you don't have good vegetative coverage and too much bare ground. And then another sign is pedestaled plants. I've actually been on a place before and the guy said, well, the plants that I do have are really starting to build back up the soil. Like, well, technically that's where the soil has eroded away except where those plants are rooted. So unfortunately, we probably won't see the uh, replacement of that inch of topsoil in our lifetime. And so it's very important that we protect our soils. And so one thing to look for is that your plants are starting to pedestal a little. So there's healthy uh, thresholds in the soil. Of course, good coverage of plants. You don't have movement. The movement at risk are those, those different four scenarios we looked at. And then you know unhealthy is where that soil is completely moving off site and in some areas they end up seeing a lot of rock. All right, and so we looked at these. I'm gonna move forward to the measuring stick. We actually have grazing sticks that have the height of different plants you might want to see in order to be leaving at least 50% stubble, but you could just simply use um, a, a yardstick for this measure. This is a little different, difficult because she's not got any plants to measure here, but technically you're going to want to take that on your place and you're going to measure your better grazing grasses to see how utilized they have been.
So a tall grass like big blue stem, you could take down to 12 to 14 inches of stubble. Whereas a mid grass like your side oats grama, you could take down to about six to eight inches of stubble. And a short grass like a buffalo grass that doesn't really get any tall anyway, you might wanna take that down to a two to three inch stubble. So you really have to know your plants on your landscape. You have to know what your better grazing plants are. And those are the ones that you're gonna to wanna to monitor to know when you should be taking your cows off or putting them on another pasture. Another thing I call the windshield method uh, is an exclosure cage. That's just where you set up kind of cattle panels with T-posts and inside that cage, it was not grazed by livestock. So you kind of have a visual of what rainfall you've gotten, what your plants would look like if they weren't grazed. And you would want to make sure to put this, this picture is sad. It's just a really good example because it's so different, but um, you could see the inside of that, the cows weren't able to get to it. And you want to make sure those are your better grazing grasses. Again, don't just randomly put it out there, put it out there on what you think the cows are going to go after first. So once it gets to about half of the use outside of that pen, you'll move them off. This is an example of an exclosure cage I put up when I was doing my postdoc out in Junction with Texas Tech. Um, this is a huge pen we put on a riparian zone and it was so cool. After only a year, we had Eastern gama grass and um, pecan tree regeneration, all kinds of things happening. In this case, we weren't fencing out the livestock, we were fencing out the deer in the hill country. Obviously, they're in very high number, both white-tailed deer and axis deer. And this was just a telltale good show for what could happen if we reduce those numbers and how that riparian zone could really come back. Photo points is another thing that could help you document that land and how it changes over time. Um, land changes because of weather, different seasons, brush encroachment, different management practices that you're applying, and of course, grazing pressure. So all of this is really great to take photos to kind of make sure that you're seeing the same thing or what you want to see season after season or year after year. Um, people say, well, I see my place every day, so I really don't need to take a picture of it. But, it, you know, for an example, my old dog, Lila, I had a friend from college come to visit and he said, wow, Lila got fat when she got old. I was like, get out of my house. My dog is not fat. Well, sure enough, Lila got a little fat, but you know, I saw her every day. And so I really didn't notice that this was happening because she looked the same to me. And the same thing happens on our properties. We see it all the time. We may not notice these big seasonal shifts, but once you start taking pictures that you can put in a book and document, you're gonna start to see some patterns that can help you make some good management decisions. So short-term monitoring would look for stocking rates, um, changes in standing uh, forage crop and responses to weed and brush control. You set up some points by picking two to five points per ecological site that's sort of alike. Put a T-post in the ground, maybe spray it with some paint or put a, I like to slip a piece of PVC pipe over it. That way you know that that T-post is there for a good reason. Um, GPS the post if possible. Put on a paper, on paper put a plot number, pasture name, date, all the information you're gonna wanna know and take a picture of it. Um, you'll do two types of photos, a vertical, and you might uh, use rebar to mark the corners for like a little frame so you can take one down. And scenic, I like to take a picture in all four cardinal directions from that T-post. That's something that you can repeat season after season or year after year. So my final thoughts are to think creatively. I think there's a lot of ways that you could utilize livestock and um, see a lot of benefit to your land from it. And if you're not interested in owning livestock, please consult us. We have resources with the extension service that can help you. Uh, we have a great ag lawyer um, that can give you some good advice on setting up a really solid grazing lease and uh, explaining exactly what you expect of that leasee. You could even charge per head per day. So they're not out anything if you say, all right, time to get them off. It's getting a little bit more heavy than I want. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can allow people to utilize your land and be getting benefit from it. A veg vegetation benefit from it. Now, if you're trying to get a hold of me, my email address is megan.clayton at ag.tamu.edu. Uh, my web address where I do have some publications under one tab is southtexasrangelands.tamu.edu. And then if you're on Facebook, check us out. We have a site called Texas Range Extension where we post some um, 
opportunities for webinars or maybe highlight a, a plant that week, all kinds of different things that are arranged 